can hear me? I think that means you guys can hear me. Good morning. Good to see. Hey, thank you. And thanks to Dennis. Always get good feedback. A lot of people watch our live stream content and I am amazed at the comments that I get, you know, just on different things. But uh, several people comment on Dennis's uh, teaching from last week. Uh, not sure who's on the phone. Good morning, if you're there. All right, I don't know if Chris wants to bring up the phone, the phone people. Well, <clears throat> we'll just go keep going. All right, commercial for Dunkin' Donuts this morning. Um, all right, so we are going to pick up where we... I think we got through some of this portion in Proverbs last time, but I definitely want to get back into it this morning. Let me pray and we'll uh, get going. Heavenly Father, thank you for the wonderful day that we have to be together this morning here on Wednesday morning under the tent. <clears throat> thank you for all the technology that we have to uh, make this ministry possible. Uh, thank you for its continuance over all these years as we've taken the opportunity to build into the lives of men and Lord, the uh, ability that the live stream has to bring forth ongoing ministry. We thank you for Grace Lighthouse Church that you have established here in Wareham. We thank you for the impact, Lord, throughout. Even people from all over can access this ministry uh, all over the world. And we, just, we do want to thank you for the internet and its ability to bring forth information, Lord. I pray that this information that we share this morning would be everything that you would want it to be. And we trust you, Heavenly Father, for the working of your Holy Spirit to bring about uh, the just the results from your word into our lives. Father, I pray for the men this morning who are in the room and ask you to be with them in their specific situations. I know there's just lots of lots of things going on and Father, I would pray that you would, um, again, just be with us in our individual times of need, even right now. Uh, we draw upon your strength and trust you, Heavenly Father, to accomplish what, what can be accomplished right now through the opening of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, a couple weeks ago, I talked about this idea of the scriptural secret to spiritual navigation. Life is a, uh, is a, in many ways, it's a time to navigate. Uh, we're, time we're born to the time we die. We've, we've made tons of decisions. Uh, some we don't even think about, some we think about, and some we regret, and some we're glad that we make them. Um, the big decision that I believe we emphasize here every Wednesday, that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Uh, that in order for you to become a new creation, you've had to make a decision. Uh, and I talked on Sunday a little bit about the amount of doors that we walk through in the course of a day. And oftentimes when you walk through a door, um, a decision's about to be made. Uh, you're go if you think about your times you walk into the grocery store, you're making decisions, you're evaluating this product you're remembering trying to remember what you need to get there looking at your list you're making decisions and so we're never really in a spot that we're not making decisions uh, sometimes decisions can be scary we don't know what's around the corner and it, in life and especially in the realm I mean I just looked at I don't know 10 news headlines this morning and I just the world is really a it's in a rough spot right now, especially the amount of violence that still is happening in the cities. And it's heartbreaking. And, the, and the, you realize that, and when I think about this, no matter what, when, when we look at a news headline, that's a result of human decision. Human beings made decisions to accomplish whatever they did, good or bad. And I think God honors God has a way of specifying in His Word, if you want a life that is a, bl is a, a blessed life, you've got to learn the secrets of spiritual navigation because you're in a messy world. God knows that we are in a world that is full of decisions, full of challenges. 
And none of us are going to get out of here. We've been born into this world. I love what the Bible says. Uh, and I don't have this one on your paper. But let, let me read this uh, from uh, John chapter 1. Remember they, they used to, you know, years ago it's like people used to flip Bible pages in church. Now everything's up on the screen. But anyway, I still like flipping pages in a Bible. So I'm in, I'm in John chapter 1. And the Bible says, but as many, speaking about Jesus Christ, and the, the, the uh, truth of this, uh, behind this portion of Scripture, is that Jesus Christ came to the nation of Israel. He was presented to the nation of Israel. When you look at all of the, all of the uh, prophetic um, promises about Messiah, and then Jesus shows up. Infant baby Jesus, virgin born, shows up. It's got to be, and when he's born, he's born into a, into a, a, an environment that you'd say, how could this be where the royal king Messiah would be born? He's born in the back of an inn, and he's born in a stable. He's 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 laid in in a manger. He's made he's laid in a feeding trough. But see, the Lord Jesus knew the world that he was coming to. He knew of all of its, all of the challenges that this world presents. And he bo was born into that. And he knew that. The Bible says that Jesus was tempted, tested in all ways as we are, yet without sin. But back in John chapter 1, the Bible says, speaking about Jesus, He was in the world, and the world was made through Him. Think about our Lord Think about, how, just think about what he did, how he humbled himself. Think of the ways that the Lord Jesus Christ humbled himself. The God of the universe, the God of all creation humbled himself. John 1 verse 10, he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own Israel and his own did not receive him, but as many as received him to them he gave the right to become children of god to those who believe in his name who were not born not of blood not of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but of god see this is the biggest decision a man can make in his life he needs to be born of god Born of God simply means that you have received the righteousness and the holiness and the gift of everlasting life through God himself. And it's Jesus. So think about the humility of God because I think you, you and I could do well today to remember that when you and I walk in a way that is right before God, God does things in our lives that no other there's no other explanation micah chapter 6 verse 8 anybody know what micah chapter 6 verse 8 says years ago and i'm talking years ago i would say over 30 years ago i was holding this up as my life verse i have probably a few of them the one that i shared with you a couple minutes ago if any man be in christ he's a new creation uh, the old is gone the new has come that is probably one of my all-time, all-time hold-on-to verses. There are times in my life where I don't feel very new. I feel like I expend a lot of energy in the course of any day, and yet I'm so grateful that the Lord supplies that. But, you know, I... You know, I realize here I am at 52 and, and, and the, you know, the, the, the trajectory of my life, Lord willing, should Jesus tarry and I get to live here and however many days the Lord gives me, um, everything that comes out of my life, I, I believe that God, God allowed that. He gave me the strength to do that. Whether I choose good or bad, which you have, we're going to look at a couple of Old Testament examples this morning of men 
who had been blessed by God, but still did some pretty horrendous things. And so I think all of the scripture is always designed to show you if you don't like something in the way something uh, plays out in the scripture, in the life of a person, like David, King David is a, a great example of, of how could David, being a man after God's own heart, still submit himself to do all types of evil. He takes another man's wife. He has that man's wife killed. Um, you know, he's, 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 he's angered when he's confronted. He thinks that the person who Nathan is talking about is some horrible guy in the, in the kingdom. And, and David wants this guy dead. And Nathan says, you're the man. You're the man. And so sometimes we, I don't think we sometimes realize the pressures that we get under. I've said this one before. Those who have been in the addiction community can certainly appreciate this one. You've heard it said, HALT. Anybody know what HALT stands for? Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. These are all vulnerable areas of a man's life. I'm telling you, there are times where I can see my irritation level get, get crazy, and, and, but then I get something to eat and I feel so much better. I don't know about you guys, but food sometimes is a weight of my heart. Um, but, you know, irritation. And, you know, you talk about diabetics. I'm not a diabetic, and I, so I don't really have a whole lot of experience in this realm. But um, I've known a couple of diabetics who, uh, they're, they're very much, they're volatile if their sugar levels go really crazy. Like if they start, start sugar spiking or their blood sugar gets uh, too high, they're irritated, they're impatient, they're unreasonable, and you realize how much affects this physical, uh, you know, this physical system that God has built. And if, 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 our, if our body's not right, sometimes we're not going to make good decisions. Uh, a, a, a man who uh, is paying attention to the signals his own body is giving him is a wise man. It's like, you know what, if I keep doing that, I'm going to be in trouble. Some people, I don't think they know their alcohol limit. So they start drinking, they have one, two, three, four drinks, and all of a sudden, they're not the person. Think about what's happening in, the, in, your, in your system when you're under the influence of alcohol. Your blood sugar, why do you think they test your blood sugar when you get pulled over? Because something has changed. And um, let me get back to where I want to go this morning. Okay, so Micah chapter 6 verse 8 goes back to a life verse for me and I when I'm when I'm in a, a bad spot and I'll just say that it, when I'm in a bad spot and it might just be with my own mind maybe something's upsetting me and I don't realize like you know I feel a sense of anger or irritation I have to remember this verse he has shown you O oh man what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? That's a verse that you and I and every Christian man should memorize. That's doing, that's doing right even when it's not convenient. That's, um, that's loving mercy. How come I love mercy? Because mercy was shown to me at the cross. I love what Ephesians chapter 4, I think it's verse 32. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, uh, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. So it's like, if you, know, if you can't give someone grace and forgiveness, do you, you really have to ask yourself, has the grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ got a hold of my heart? Gentlemen, I know that this might be in a hard spot for some of us, but we have to remember those of us who name the name of Jesus Christ and are wanting to walk and have his favor on our lives, we got to be real careful about the grudges that we could hold in this life. You got to let it go. And I'm a big believer that some, there's some things in my life, I just have to let it go. Just, and, and I think when you let it go as a Christian, you're letting it go into the hands of God. Lord, I want to take this one back. Somebody says the problem with a living sacrifice, it keeps getting up and leaving the altar. You ever heard that one? 
You know, uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech thee that therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. In other words, you, what you're living and your, your day-to-day choices are, are empowered by the Holy Spirit who's in you. Just keep that in mind. Don't let that ever t- be taken away from you. When Christ saved you, He Spirit empowered you. He Spirit regenerated you. He Spirit sealed you. And as a result of that, you have the Holy Spirit. Even when everything else is working against you. Even when everything else is coming at us in a way that's like, I don't like this, I'm not happy about this, but Lord, I trust you. A man who walks humbly with God is a man who will make wise decisions. He can see something before he's in it. Oh my goodness. I've been teaching my wife a little bit because my wife has... um, her body having gone through bone marrow transplant and as much as she has stretched and done all the things that she tried to keep her body agile she still has a tripping tendency the other night three o'clock in the morning all of a sudden my wife has to get up use the restroom and in the process of traveling to the restroom she trips on our bedroom rug goes face down smacks her face against our floor and i said to her honey I love you, but if you detect anything in our home that is a tripping hazard for you, treat it like a landmine. It could blow you up. Okay, it's they, you know, because at three o'clock in the morning, we're not often as alert as we should be, right? So if you, you know, if you see something, I think that's a there's a spiritual lesson there too for all of us. If you see something in your life, men, if you see pornography, and I speak this to my own life. Good men are tempted. It doesn't matter how much you think you've got victory over any of this stuff. If pornography is a trap for you, as it as might excite your curiosity for a moment, get away from it. Just get away from it. Just turn that computer off. It's gonna bite you. Yes, brother. If you're gonna, if you speak, speak to the mic. I think this is good. Another little thing is shine a little light on the trip hazard on the porn on the whatever that's a a trip hazard in life exactly part of navigation is follow the lights in the sky that's right amen yeah no it's good i I mean literally sometimes we have to just be wise I, i think this is this is one of the most important area of a man's life is to live wisely and uh, you know, you, you, when we talk about, we, we will, the Bible says we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's for the believer. You as a man of God, you're going to be in front of Jesus for evaluation. And in, instead of being so afraid of that, say, thank you that I get to be there. However, I want to make my evaluation count. A lot of that evaluation is based upon what the Word of God teaches us in these finer moments of life. Your Monday through Saturday or Sunday, whatever, whatever you know, your, your, your decision time. And I, gentlemen, I, I'm just so grateful for you to be here, I truly. Um, but Micah sa- chapter 6, verse 8, is a life verse for me. He's shown you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's an awesome, you know, I love the one, the story about Enoch. Enoch was no more. He was taken, right? Because he walked with God. Can you, see, I think that's, that's, the, that's the wonderful thing about the rapture of the church, that when Jesus says, you know what, it's all done. In other words, it's all done in terms of what's been done here on this earth, it, as far as from the, the church perspective, keep in mind, the church is not buildings it's people and right now when jesus returned to heaven until this very moment that you and i are in right now what's the date today the 23rd 23rd so from the time our lord ascended back to heaven till june 23rd right at this very moment he's been building his church he's been adding to it throughout all these generations 1900s, 1800s, 1700s, 1600s, 1500s, all the way back to when he ascended to heaven. He says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. But there comes a point where the church is complete. You and I don't know when that is. He does. 
When he says it's done, it's done. The Bible calls that when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. In other words, that's every Jew and every Gentile who has believed Christ, who's, who's the Savior of the world. What John says, as many who had received him, he gave the right to become children of God, even those who believe in his name. Those people are added to this wonderful organism called the church. And they're the people who said, Jesus, I've appropriated your gift, your salvation to my life. And I'm in Christ. I have, but what does the Bible says? The Bible says without holiness, no one will see the Lord. How do you see the Lord except through Jesus Christ? You don't see him because Christ is your righteousness. So you want to learn to work, walk humbly with your God. I'm going to read through Proverbs 3, 1 to 15. I'm just going to read it again. And then I want to comment on some of these other verses. My son, do not forget my law. This is what Solomon is writing to his son. But let, let your heart keep my commands for length of days and long life. In peace, they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father the son in whom he delights. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. For her proceeds are better than the profits of silver and her grain than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies and all the things you may desire cannot compare with her. This is wisdom. This is how God values wisdom. Men, one thing you and I should never forget, you were born into a world that was sinful because you have and I have sin. Sin causes all the problems. But through Jesus Christ, the Bible says, 1 John 4, 4. Is that what it is? Yeah, 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, in you than he who is in this world. That's why we're still seeing a lot of evil in our midst because Satan absolutely has access to this earth. Jesus Christ has access to your life by giving you eternal life. When, he, when you receive the life that Christ gives you, you are now a marked man by Jesus. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in this world. So Christ, my friends, is in you. Don't ever forget it. But God wants you to have the wisdom to continue to live as many days as you have and I have. He wants you to live them according to his word and his ways because he loves you. He wants so much for each of us, not just giving us stuff, but giving us joy, giving us delight, giving us opportunity to serve him. I love what Second Chronicles says in chapter 16, verse 9. I love this. Just think about, see, you know, you, this is where it gets really good. You got to think like this. You be this man. You be this person. You be this guy. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly. He's talking is this a, I'm trying to remember the king that he's talking to here. Therefore, from now on, you shall have wars. So he's, in other words, here's the blessing and the curse. God says, if, if, if a man will set his eyes upon me, if he will delight in me, if he will honor me, I will, I will notice that. I will take special delight in the guy who loves me. You guys wouldn't be here if you didn't love Jesus. So take this for yourself today. Doesn't mean you're always going to get it right, but you want, you want to get it right. James 1, verse 5 and 7, it's on the front of the paper. So hopefully you guys are following with me because everything I've read here in the last couple of minutes, going, you know, right down, right down the line here. If any of you, ah, I love this. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God 
<laughs> who gives to all, they think about this, the God of the universe, Jesus Christ, wants to give you liberally, wants to give you, he wants to give generously to you. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally. What reproach is pulling back? Reproach. You don't want to be around it. God says he's going to give you wisdom liberally without reproach. And it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith. Not with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea. Driven and tossed by the wind. But let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's double minded man. Unstable in all his ways. One thing I've learned in my life, and I want to say, I said to, I said to Beth this morning on my way out the door, I went through a crisis in 2012. It was a crisis of direction. I had just spent 10 years of my life investing my life in the ministry of radio for men. Uh, called Man to Man Express. Had a wonderful run with Brian Doyle and uh, some changes had happened and, and just things were changing. And I was beginning, the, the process was looking more uncertain for me about the future. I was active in another church in Sandwich and uh, was serving it over there. Um, before I tell you that part, around that week uh, that I was getting news that the radio ministry would be ending, I got a call from Dennis Clough. And the meeting that Dennis and I wound up having within a couple of days of his email was nothing less than of God. Because it led to this. It led to what we're in right now. And sometimes the lowest moments of, a, of your life can be the beginning of what the greatest blessing is. If you will lay hold of what God has. The problem with many men is they don't fully embrace all that God has for them. They hold back. And how does a man hold back? He limits himself. He says, oh, well, I haven't lived the way I should. Therefore, I'm not worthy. And now you walk around like you're not worthy. And they never really receive from God because you feel unworthy. Get over that one because Christ makes you worthy. Jesus makes you worthy. And see, men who accomplish things for God. It doesn't mean that everything that you accomplish, that everybody's seeing. But guess who sees it? God. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking whose hearts are fully devoted to Him. And so, when you and I get this, we should assert ourselves in confidence before the Lord. Not arrogantly, but humbly. Lord, do you want us to buy a tent? I think you do. Lord, would you provide for everything that we need on this property? And the Lord, to his glory, did everything, provided everything that we needed. See, this is not health and wealth. I don't demand from God. I submit to him. And I say, Lord, whatever we do as a church, and maybe this is too, I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm not saying this is small at all, but maybe this is only part of it. Maybe, maybe what God wants to do in this time in history, until he calls his church home, he wants to bless this even bigger. Maybe he's got a different piece of property at some point. I have no idea. I'm not so concerned about that. But I think sometimes we don't, we don't, we don't believe God enough. We don't trust him enough. We got to trust him. If any of you lacks wisdom, says James, let him ask of God. Who gives to all liberally without reproach? And it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith. In other words, this is trusting him. With no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea. You see what happens out in the... You ever been on a boat? How many guys have been on a boat? Anybody ever got really seasick? When you were little. I've been seasick more than I want to admit. But one time my father-in-law took me on a sailing trip. Um... Bob was, Bob, 
was a wonderful uh, sailor, loved to sail. He would sail from places like Plymouth out to Newport, Newport, back all through Buzzards Bay. Anyway, my wife and I, um, at the time, I, either we were early married or just before we were married, um, he took us out on a trip and uh, we landed off of Newport. We were started in Newport and we ended out on Cuddyhunk. You ever been on, but you ever been to Cuddyhunk? Yeah, the Elizabethan Islands over there. I mean, this is a whole other world. I mean, like, it, like, this is crazy. Like, I can't believe like this is not that far from our shore, and yet there's houses and roads and stores. Like, this seems like a place to be. Anyway, so on our way to Cuddyhunk, it it was stormy, and I got so seasick. I. <laughs> I don't know if you guys, have you ever watched somebody else throw up? It makes you want to throw up. Anyway, that's kind of what happened to me that day. Somebody else was with us and she got sick and I'm like, oh, I'm going down below. The warning is you never go down below. The worst thing. The worst thing. I'm down there laying down, the boat's being tossed. And uh, a person who's being tossed on a boat is being seasick. You're being tossed to and fro, to and fro. Many people live their life like this because they're tossed and they're disoriented and they can't get up and they don't know where they are and they're lost they're acting like they're a lost person christians never a lost person but they can look they can act as if they are and 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 they're not there's going to be many times in my life probably between now and when i see jesus that i could feel like lord i don't know what to do here this is a mess i, I don't have the brains to do this apart from you doing this and I don't, you know, and I, I do think we, I should, let me just say, I do think God does teach us. And I think some of those lessons do get taught, but don't always rely that every, that your next trial is going to be as successful as your last one, because it's still going to require faith and trust during that time. So God wants you to expect that he's going to give you wisdom and he doesn't want you doubting living in that realm. I'm going to have you guys turn that paper over. So, um, how are we doing on time here? Okay, we're good. So, in Colossians, I was struck by this a couple weeks ago. Paul says, so you've got to remember that the apostle was given the responsibility by Jesus himself to give special instructions to this new thing called the church. We get tons of, we get tons of scriptures out of the Old Testament. But there's a specific set of instructions given for you and me. And those are the epistles, specifically by Paul about the church. Peter doesn't talk a whole lot about the church because his ministry was to the Jewish people. Remember what scripture says? Peter, James, and John sent to the Jews. I and Barnabas sent to the Gentiles. In other words, mission, purpose, what, God, what Jesus wants. So Paul is tasked to write a lot of the um, script, much of the scripture of the New Testament. About 25% of your Bible is written by the Apostle Paul. And he's speaking about the church here. He says, for I want you to know what great conflict I have for you and for those in Laodicea. This is the church. Remember, Jesus addresses the church at Laodicea. And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh... In other words, the apostle was there, and then he wouldn't be there. A Colossians is one of those prison epistles. He has to do, Paul has to write from prison back to these churches that he once invested time in. So he's communicating with them, whether he's present or absent. Remember, whether absent or present, he'll often use that term. But he says here, for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love and attaining to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God. Well, what's the mystery of God? That he could place you, my brothers, into this wonderful thing called the church. That if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And that's you. And that's your life. And that's every person who's lived before you. And God wants these scriptures understood so that you can live your life in, a, in, a, in full assurance 
being knit together in love and attaining to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, to whom, here's this, think about what Jesus has given to you, in whom are, all, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In other words, all the secrets of this universe, all the secrets of how a man gets saved lies with Jesus Christ. And God says, you've got access to this wisdom if you will use it. If you'll use it for my glory, I will give it to you. Paul says, uh, in, in that, so that's Colossians 2, 1-3. 1 Corinthians 6, 1-11, Paul says, and such were some of you. He's talking about people who lived a certain way before they were saved. But you were washed. See, this is you. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Our behavior, as bad as it can be, does not define us as a Christian. It doesn't, that doesn't, even though we can still sin and do things that are wrong, man, if you get this, you're a new creation. The moment you receive Christ, you are a new creation. The, the secret is learning to live like a new creation. That's where wisdom comes into our lives. Because we all still have this propensity to do evil. We could still do it. It doesn't take much to set a man off. Like, I mean, I, 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 I can't tell you. I, one thing I've learned in my, in my life these last couple years is to keep my hands on 10 and 2. Don't be paying attention to them. And then I'm paying attention to that road. And the amount of road rage that people get into because somebody pulls up beside them or they're on someone's tail and somebody's like, you're feeling ticked off about this. I'm telling you guys, that's a landmine right there. If you don't like the way someone's driving, you back off. Just back off. Satan's looking to get... Pull over. Pull over. Just don't engage in that stuff. You walk into a city where there's violence pulling going on, get out of there. Get the heck out of there. Just get out of there. If you if you like you're going to you go into some hopefully if you, if somebody's going to some peaceful protest and all of a sudden it's breaking out, get out of there. You don't want to be caught in that stuff. The stuff that happened on the Capitol, that was a landmine. And a lot of people jumped on that one and they were stupid. There's peaceful protesting, but when it turns crazy, get out of there. That's all I'm just going to say about that. Um, so the scripture says that you've been washed, you've been sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. God keeps his promise to you. God keeps his promise to you. Now, I love this. Where are we here? Oh. Yeah, there we go. Steve, why don't you come up and read that, my brother? By the way, um, I heard a thing on um, 90.5 radio about um, you're driving around with that little fish symbol on the back of your car and how you drive is a testimony, um, especially if you're, you've got that mark on your car. Um, anyways. Now we at verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 6. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words, or not just in words, which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Amen, brother. And that's Thank why John says, test the spirits. How do you test the spirits? Read the Word of God. Well and know it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think the challenge today is that just 
just to know the Word of God and how to navigate life with the Word of God is so much of the battle. I mean, if we just would just get that, we would, we would be so much better um, because life will try to toss us and, and we should be aware of that. Um, yet you can be anchored in Christ know your territory know what belongs to you jesus says don't fear those who can kill the body rather fear him who can place both body and soul in hell so my ultimate my ultimate trust is in the lord who not only made me but saved me isn't that awesome god's god made you you're made in his image and he wants to save you that is just like wild wild wildly good all right so steve shared that scripture and i think the the one thing about you know we the wisdom that you and i have access to is scriptural it's godly it's god breathed it's everything that god wants us to know and god wants you delighting in him in other words men settle your salvation once and for all no matter what's broken apart in your life you are living as a saved man who's loved by Jesus. Now you walk with him with full confidence that he's never going to leave you, never going to forsake you. No matter what men might say about you, oh well. You go with the one who's already declared you guiltless and sinless in his eyes. That is powerful stuff. That will make you hungry for the wisdom that belongs to you. See, God's can, in one sense, God's competing for you. So is Satan. God loves you that much. If you wanted, someone said, how much does Jesus love me? He spread his arms and he died for me. On a cross. Spilt his precious blood for me. So he's competing for you. Because Satan also wants you. All right, I'm going to read this. I'm just going to just read through it and make, make a couple comments. This is 1 Kings chapter 3, 1 to 5. And then I got two other scriptures, short ones that I want to add to the, this. Um, comparing scripture with scripture, as Paul just said to, for us to do in, sec, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now Solomon made a treaty with Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and married Pharaoh's daughter. And then he brought her to, a city of, to the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall all around Jerusalem. Meanwhile, the people sacrificed at the high places because they were, there was no house built for the name of the Lord until those days. And Solomon loved the Lord walking in the statutes of his father David, except that he sacrificed and burnt incense at the high places. Now the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place Solomon uh, for that was the great high place. Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on the altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask whatever, ask, what shall I give you? Um, ask, what shall I give you? And then Solomon said, you have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, in an upright, uprightness of heart with you. Let me stop right there. Look at David's, look at the way David is declared by Scripture, in spite of his failure, how he walked with God. The Bible calls him a man after his own heart. Don't let one failure in your life hold you back. And Satan would want to do that to all of us. Oh, you, 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 but if you really meant it, you wouldn't have done that. Well, no, you were just ignorant of Satan's schemes at that moment. But that doesn't define you as a child of God, ever. Go with who defines you. Go, you gotta go with this stuff, okay? You gotta go with the record of scripture. Um, you have continued this great kindness for him and you have given him a son to sit on his throne as of this day. Now, O oh Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David. But I'm a little child. He's a little child because he's, he's young in life. He's about 20 years of age at this time. And he doesn't have a whole lot of experience. And this is a good place for you to be. 
Lord, sometimes I'm like a little child. I don't have a lot of experience in these areas and I'm going to need it from you. I do not know how to go out or come in. See Solomon's humility here? And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you've chosen, a great people too numerous to be numbered or counted. In other words, this is kind of overwhelming. I don't know what to do with all these people and I'm the king. You've given me the throne. I've built for you, Lord, a house. I've built my own house. I've got a city, a wall around Jerusalem. But I don't know how to manage all these people. I don't know how to do this. Therefore, give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who's able to judge this great people of yours? See, this is God's work. The, ba the Bible says the battle is not ours. It's the Lord's. God put you here for such a time as this. The speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Then God said to him, because you have asked this thing and have not asked long life for yourself. See, he wasn't myopic. He's give me more stuff, God. Give me more stuff. Because you've asked this thing, you've not asked long life for yourself, nor asked of asked riches for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, but you've asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. Behold, I've done according to your word. See, I've given you a wise and an understanding heart so that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any like you arise after you. And I have also given you what you have not asked both riches and honor so that there shall be there shall not be anyone like you among all the kings all your days see what god says will happen will happen okay <laughs> jesus says i will come again and i will receive you to myself count on it okay it's not, it doesn't matter yeah i know the world's crazy jesus is going to keep his promise to you personally he's keeping his promise to you if anyone before you like you and i and, and verse 13 here and i have also given you what you've not asked both riches and honor so that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings of your days so if you walk in my ways so there's an if here it's a condition to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, and I will lengthen your days. And Solomon awoke, and indeed it had been a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings, offered peace offerings, and made a feast for all his servants. In other words, I know that God is going to keep his word to me. And Solomon, and God did keep his word. Solomon didn't do it all right. But you see, as he wrote, if you turn that paper back over, think about the wisdom that God has passed on through Solomon, through all of his failure. I believe Solomon in many ways was a man after God's own heart, still honored by Christ his whole life. See, God makes good on his promise. We have to remember that because if we don't remember that, we'll start relying too much upon, our, too much upon ourselves and we'll, free, we'll think that God is not with me. Don't ever think that way. And uh, I just, let me close here with Ephesians chapter 2. I, you know, when you, when you look back on the sacrifices that they made, and uh, it, Gibeon was about five miles outside of Jerusalem, and Gibeon was the place that they would go. The Canaanites actually went there. The Canaanites were known for sacrificing at the high places. It was false worship. See, they, see here's, the, here's the thought. If I can, Tower of Babel, I, some, some believe the Tower of Babel was actually so that they would never be flooded again. And, and, but also some also commentators said that this is where God is. God's in the high places. There's always that tendency to think that God is, out, is up there. And if we could just get to him, we, we, we would have a greater level of intimacy. Actually, the Bible says the Holy Spirit has come to live right in your heart right now. I just want to point something out to you. Uh, Roger, you got a Bible there, buddy? Could you come up and read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13? The 
Ephesians chapter 2 verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Amen. My brothers, you cannot get any closer to God than the way, than this. in other words, you may feel closer to God and you may know him more intimately, but everything has been moved out of the way because of the blood of Jesus Christ so that you could have relationship with him. You don't have to seek the high places. You don't have to go far away to know God. You can know God right where you are, any day, 24 seven, right where you're at. The blood of Christ is what brought you near. And um, I just need to be reminded of that myself, that I have what I need to obtain all the wisdom of God because ultimately I've been brought to God through his own son and the blood that he shed for me. Amen? Amen. All right. All right, anybody on the call this morning, Chris? All participants are unmuted. Good morning. Hey, good morning, Brother Mike. Hi. Yeah, I've been listening and loving it. Praise the Lord. Yeah, wonderful scriptures. Mike, how you doing? Good. Good. Yeah, um, this, this morning it didn't work getting up so early, so I just called in. All right. We're glad you could be with us. Would you like to close us in prayer? Sure. Yeah, dear God in heaven, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this opportunity to meet in your name, Lord. Thank you so much for your salvation. Thank you so much for your word that just opens itself to us over and over again. Even when we've read it, it just opens our eyes even more every time, Lord God. And, and thank you for the Grace Lighthouse Church to be in the new tent now. Thank you for their outreach. And bless us all as we go to work to where people would see you through us, Lord God. And we wouldn't block out the vision of you so we can bring your testimony, Lord God, everywhere we go. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Mike. Maybe we'll see you soon here. We'd love that, and but glad you could be on the phone.